Hello and welcome back to Let's Play Pillars of Eternity with me, Bring It Down. Let's go and explore the inside of the buildings of Brackenbury. Alright, we're right. gonna start with Raymont Manor. Margaret's fire casts light in dark places. I've read that book before. I do want that money though. I'm on the trail. Huh? All right, this is new. The Light of Dawn, the Great Siren Morality Play, Part 1. Charity and Generosity. Characters in order of appearance. Man, male, a ghostly being. Female, a ghostly being. Beggar, starving man, injured man. Setting, empty field, no trees or buildings in sight. The man lies on the ground center stage. He wakes slowly and looks around. Two ghostly beings approach him. A male from the stage left, a female from stage right. Man, where am I? What has happened? Male, nothing has happened. Man, how did I get here? Female, you did not arrive. You are just here. Man, what is going on? Male and female, you are traveling. We will travel with you. They both reach out a hand to him, insistently. He looks at them, not sure what to do. After a few moments of deliberation, he takes male's hand and allows him to help. Male, aside to female, his soul is strong. This decision will be easy. Female, aside to male, such arrogance surely will be your undoing. They walk to the end of the stage and encounter a beggar, holding out a bowl. Beggar, will you help the needy? We hear the call of charity. What will you do for those less fortunate? Male, here is a beggar. What will you do? He has no food, no clothes. He is destitute and will surely die if no mercy is shown him. Female, surely he deserves no mercy. Look to his legs. Do they not move? Look to his arms. Can they not work? Look to his eyes. Can they not see? Surely he can provide for himself. Male and female. What will you do? The man ponders for a moment, then reaches into his pocket and drops a coin in the beggar's bowl. Beggar. Thank you, kind sir. May your charity come back to you in turn. Male and female. Why did you give alms to this beggar? Man. I saw a man in need. It's not for me to say if he deserves mercy. Only that I need provide mercy if I am able. I have the means to help, so I help. He has the ability to provide for himself and does not, and is on his head, not mine. If I can provide the light of dawn to a man in need, it is my duty to do so. Male, aside to female, he knows charity, even disguised as a beggar. His mind is open. Female, aside to male, even those with an open mind can be closed down. Male and female, let us continue our journey. They walk to the other edge of the stage, leaving the beggar behind. They approach the starving man, who puts out his hands in supplication. Starving man, a crust? A morsel? Please. Surely generosity would not allow you to stand by and let someone starve. Male. This man is starving. What will you do? He is on the brink of death. Only an act of generosity will save him. Female. When it has this man that he cannot provide for himself, why should you turn over that which you earned to one who has done no such act and who deserves nothing from you? Male and female, what will you do? Again, the man considers what he will do. He reaches into his pocket, retrieves a piece of bread, and gives it to the starving man. Starving man, thank you, thank you, good sir. May your generosity be returned unto you tenfold. Male and female, why did you give food to the hungry? Man. I saw a man who hungered. It's not for me to say if he deserves a morsel, only that I need provide a morsel if I am able. I have the food to spare, so I give. I can open a man's eyes to the light. It is my duty to do so. Male, aside to female. He knows generosity, even disguised as a starving man. His heart is giving. Female, aside to male. Even those with a giving heart can be greedy. Male and female, we will continue our 
journey. Oh, that's it. Okay. But oh, that's right. Yeah. It's part one. <laughs> that makes sense. That's Lord Raymond. The ledger lists quantities of wheat, copper, and werewool. A deep crease along the spine suggests that the book never closes. Shh. Alas, it is closed right now. Well met, friend. Lord Raymond holds a shipping manifest in his well-manicured hands. Despite his expensive clothes, he has the sallow complexion and restless air of a man who devotes all of his days and most of his nights to work. If you have business to discuss, make an appointment with my attendant. I don't have time for unexpected visitors. Tell me about yourself. He snaps the pages in his hands. I am lord of this house and not prone to idle chatter. If you have no business here, I suggest you be off. He doesn't look up from his papers. Okay, Hail buddy. And well met. He sighs and shuffles a stack of papers. You again. Give letter. I've uncovered a plot to rob you. He lowers his papers and looks at you for the first time. Is that so? Let me see that. He scans the parchment with the speed of an expert clerk. Moderate negative. When he returns his attention to you, his tone is brisk and businesslike. You've done this house and this city a great service. I'm certain you'll consider this an adequate reward for your labors. Uh, what will you do now? Well, Raymond pinches crisp, sharp creases into the note. Eliminate the competition. Ooh, Ring of Unshackling added to inventory. And 2,000 copper. Nice. The letter was signed AD. Does that mean anything to you? I suspect it means Abricon Domino, the scion of House Domino. Look with disgust crosses his face. A pampered, pandered lad, if ever there was one. He's ruthless. I'll give him that much. Unfortunately, he doesn't have the wits to match his appetites. Tell me about House Domino. There once an eminent and admired house. Now, it is a den of thieves. Back in the Deerwood's colonial days, the Dominoes were respected members of the Ducal Court, which is why it is so surprising they remained loyal to Adir during Hadrit's Rebellion. When Hadrit and the Deerwood won independence, the Dominoes lost their favor, but not their wealth. Rather than return to Adir, like their loyalist houses, oh, sorry, like other loyalist houses, they dug their heels in here and turned from politics to commerce. He shrugs. In one way of looking at it, they simply partnered with the wrong side. Now that they haven't prospered since in their own way. Uh, he rubs his jaw. Sorry, I think I said now, but I meant not. He rubs his jaw. Lately, they've been seeking to carve out a new niche for themselves. One right between the Crucible Knights and the Dozens, it seems. What's so important about this gem? The Heart of White March is a nearly flawless diamond. It's also the patrimony of the Dwarves of White March. It was seized by an Adiran Lord in the early days of colonization. The Dwarves haven't forgotten it. Now, the Knights and the Dozens are both bidding for it to make a peace offering to the Dwarves. He shrugs. Whichever party buys it, the Dwarves will make useful allies for Defiance Bay. Especially these days. There are a lot of intellect checks. I was expecting more resolve checks since it's the personality one. Uh, farewell. Yeah. Ready, watcher. I'd like to pick this. I don't know if I can. I lost it to bandits. Okay. Uh, what's next? Let's go and grab the dungeons. That sounds useful. I don't want to risk missing any potential prisoners. Merchant might also be good, but let's we're gonna start with the dungeons. The dungeons of Caden Walk contain nine cells. Upgrading the dungeon will allow you to take prisoners during your travels. Huh. Ready, watcher. What a quick save. I think I'm mad if I it's it is red. Hi? 
There's no way mm. they're not going to get mad if I try to lockpick that. Sprigs of dried lavender and rosemary infuse the kitchen with a fresh aroma. Nice and quiet. Lynette Raymond. Slow and silent. Father never reads to me. He's always busy with his own books. He doesn't, you don't want him to read those books to you anyway. Not probably. They're probably not exciting. <laughs> Of the labels, all perfectly angled outward, boast an array of fine vintages. However, they're all coated in dust. Did not mean to do that. I meant to click X. It's okay. Slow and silent. How is our... Oh, that's right. It's Domino. For some reason I thought it was Raymond that got upset with us, but it was it was Domino. Which makes sense as we foiled their plot. Oh gosh. But the old serving woman regards you with bleary eyes. Begging your pardon, I'm afraid I'll have to ask you to return downstairs. Visitors aren't permitted on the upper floor. So I could backhand her or attack. I'm gonna go back downstairs. If we have a reason to go up there, we'll find that later. I'm not going to attack a servant. <laughs> Too very extreme. Like, I couldn't even try, like, convincing her to stay up there. It's either attack or attack. <laughs> or I guess attack or assault. Wristwin. It's Nonton. Familiar face. Understudy. The scripts and props belong to a production of the most unfortunate, Caleb Favia and Bernat. Keeping quiet. All right. Since he's the first one we saw, we'll speak with Thriswin first. The young elf is dressed in gaudy robes, and he seems ready to cast off. But that he seems ready to cast off. He picks at a heavily brocaded sleeve, continually adjusts the gold chain around his neck. He looks up at you. Did she send you to run me out of town? Can you tell her I'm not going anywhere without that medallion? I told Sorrel I wouldn't let her sell it. That's what you're here about, and save yourself the trouble. He puffs up his chest but glances at the exit. I just tell me what the problem is. He relaxes. You have to ask, and you're obviously not here to shake me down. Sorrel's a courtesan over the salty mast in Andre's gift. We've been working together for over a year now. I find a noble with more money than sense, fill him up with liquor, and send him her way. They have a good time, and Sorrel takes her fee, and a little extra. He rubs his fingers together. A hundred coppers here, a trinket there. It's a bounty for us. These lords and ladies never notice anything missing. Yeah, no harm done then. Anyway, why split the bounty? Until a week ago. He squeezes his lips into a tight frown. He takes a necklace off of some noble. It's an Ingwithin medallion. Darn near priceless. That relic is sacred to my clan, but she won't part with it for any sum I could offer or afford. He tugs at the gold chain around his neck. Even if I wanted to, I can't go home without it. Tagani's brow furrows in pity. That's a hard thing. Well, tell me more about your situation. He picks at the hem of his sleeve. What do you want to know? What makes this medallion so important to you? I grew up in Ir Glonfoth, in the Shattering Spear Clan. The Glonfothans have protected Ingwithin ruins for thousands of years. It's the one duty the gods ask of us in exchange for the freedom to live as we please. He fidgets with an emerald ring in his, on his pinky. The treasure hunters looted the ruins in our territory, but left the wilds we dwelled in for generations. Most of my clan mates scattered to towns around the Deerwood, and probably live on crusts of bread. He looks at his embroidered robes with disgust. Restoring this medallion to the ruins would earn us the gods' forgiveness. The Shattering Spear could go home. This is all rather fascinating. A single medallion, 
earn the gods' favor, and so return home. It rather reminds me of... or... a story I heard. Somewhere. Tell me about Sorrel. So the court ascended the salty mast, over an Andre's gift. She wasn't born to much, but she's done what she has to in order to escape that. He gazes at a string of amber beads around his wrist. She's a good friend. He folds his arms in his trailing, wrinkled sleeves. Without her, I'd probably be living hand to mouth like the rest of the Shattering Spear. But this isn't about her or me. It's about the 40 people in my clan, the way of life we've held on, to, held to for generations. I keep trying to fill in blanks in these sentences, like how I would have written it. I'm uh, not reading ahead as I read. Oh, you seem like you've done well enough for yourself. He clenches his heavily adorned hands. It was this, or scrape by in the gutters like the rest of my clan. I give it all for that medallion. I offered to, but it's worth more than anything I've got, and Sorrel knows it. I still understand why you can't take your money, return it Ir Glanfob. He sighs, arching his neatly plucked eyebrows. That's because you're used to looking at things with detachment. A community isn't a place, it's a connection to history and meaning. He makes circles with his wrist, like an anchor. Defending the ruins for the gods gave us a purpose. Without that, we're adrift. Does this make any sense to you? I'm not sure yet. Uh, yes. He smiles and nods slowly. Then you know what it's like. How to care for something you can't explain. Alright, that's all I wanted to ask. So, will you help me get the medallion? I'll see about getting the medallion from Sorrel. You'll find her at the Salty Mast. The only way anyone sees her these days is by paying. So you have to go through Maya. Mia. He fidgets with his sleeve. But whatever you do, please don't hurt her. Yeah. Hail, traveler. The fancy elf eyes you and your pack. Did you do it? Did you get the medallion from Sorrel? Not yet. Right. Hey, what's going on, Nonson? Uh, begging your pardon. Oh, it's you. It's good to see you well. Had a few rough days here, but then we found this place. They're kind enough to hire us both. Things have been wonderful. I can't tell you how much we appreciate what you've done. I really didn't do a whole lot. I just kind of didn't do anything. <laughs> well, I extorted you for money. I shall be discreet. Seven smells of roast game, hen, and baking bread. There's a basement as well. I speak to the innkeeper first. I will also speak to Ingrid. It's hard work, but good wages. Can't complain. Abelhart Skirian. Well met, friend. The man is dressed in neat but functional clothes. His sunwrinkled skin and limber musculature reflect the life spent in the wilderness. Well met. What brings you to the charred barrel? Is this your place? It's my retirement. He thumps the bar. It used to be a warehouse back when Brackenbury saw more ship traffic, but it fell out of use when the area became mostly residential. I inherited it from some great uncle, who never had any luck pawning it off on my cousins. Now, it's the most popular spot in Brackenbury. The nobles come to unwind, and kids from the other districts come to mingle. He leans closer. We get a few rough types too. But they behave in here. Besides, the coin's as good as anyone else's. Uh, who are you? As a cartographer for the Duke for decades, he rubs his neatly stubbled cheek. Across the White March half a dozen times, and map most of the ruins of Thane Bog. He grins, flashing a gold tooth. A good career, but one suited to younger men. When I came back to Defiance Bay for good, Fliver and a few other friends in the Knights helped me get the rights to refurbish this place. A strong ale, quality entertainment, and a fresh sea breeze. He raises a mug. What more could a man want? Let me see your rooms. Okay, so we're going to rest at the noble stay after we're done speaking with him. Hello. Uh, what can I get you? Are there any adventurers here that I could hire? Indeed. Take your pick. Good day to you. Uh, show me your menu. 
What do you got? All right, no animal companions or anything like that. No pets. Hey, I didn't look at this ring that we got. The Ring of Unshackling. Grants suppress affliction to per rest. Hostile effects suspended over five seconds. What is it? Only for us from the AoE. All right, so we get this endurance. These are support. Huh? Well met, friend. Oh, let's go ahead and rest. Noble stay. That's going to give us a plus two intellect and plus one will. We're a little roughed up, so it works out. Right. All right, we're going to go to the basement, then we'll go upstairs. And then we're going to return to the catacombs and speak to that other guy. So we have the plus two intellect from the rest. And the headwear that Aloth has equipped is another plus two intellect. I think it was 14. It wasn't more than 14 for that one check with uh, Eora. The proprietor has collected a respectable variety of bottles from around the world. From tart adir reds to sweet summer wines of uh, Roatai. Class of the infamous Soulburn of the Deadfire Archipelago are nestled next to crystal clear Nasutaki and Glamfelon spirits. I'm on the trail. Pale yellow and deep amber whiskeys from the deer wood and the living lands rest side by side. Light, flame, and sound. We'll keep to ourselves. So having a little chat with my associates. I'm assuming that'll be tied to a quest later. But nothing to fret about right now. You must gather your party before venturing forth. Yeah, yeah, I've heard it before. It's map charts routes to the White March. All right, so that's uh, innkeeper's handiwork, I'm sure. Hanging up what he's done. All right, Mayor with watches you through a coal, through coal rimmed eyes. Sounds in that right coal. I've seen that somewhere else before. I need to look that up. Uh, she puts her hands on the hilt of her blade, feeling the jewels that hang from her wrist. We don't know each other, stranger. Best we keep it that way. Uh, what brings you to the charred barrel? Completely ignoring her comment. Mayor with raises an eyebrow. What's it look like? Good wine, and a little peace and quiet. Clips a copper coin with her thumb. And Scarion doesn't ask too many questions. Yeah, pirates and bandits. Uh, you don't seem like a Brackenberry local. I'm a sailor. He gives you a half smile. And a liberator of certain goods. Mary with casually fingers a large earring. Nice thing about the snobs here is they're usually too polite to ask more. I'll be going. Silent. Okay, I've read that before. We can sell uh -huh. it. Next Matil water jug fashioned from white clay. I shall be quiet as a calm sea, which is not very quiet. I'll see what I can find. The map of the Deerwood in Ir Glonfoth appears to predate the discovery of some of the ruins in the east. It's signed by the cartographer A. Scarion. The ashtray is painted with colorful waves and whirls in the style of Roatai. I'm on the trail. I'll have it in no time. Nope. Lock pick that. People will be upset at us. Okay, we'll head back to the catacombs and see if we can't pass that one check.
Then we'll come back here and finish exploring. I could wait to do the sanitarium first. No, this is fine. Breaks up the monotony a little bit. I'm pretty sure none of the checks with this guy were over 14. Oh cool, I'm already at 14. Alright, so I read all this. A sad tale. But not the whole story, I think. What are you hiding? Roland looks away, clearly agitated. I'm just trying to get by. Something else to it. As into your liking, a whole lot of catacombs out there for you to have it all have all to yourself. You make a poor liar. Yorn opens his mouth to snap something, his hands balled into fists. But he thinks better of it. He shakes his head slowly, expression resigned. The orange sighs heavily. Very well. It's true. I've been hiding from the knights down here. But it isn't what you think. He ducks his head. It was an accident. It's been hard for me here in Defiance Bay. I suppose I thought if I got involved in city business, if I made the right friends, it would get easier in time. And it did, really. I made a name for myself. A place. People actually listen to me when I talk. Well, they used to. People can get very passionate about these things. We're discussing, I think it was shipping agreements, all the things to fight over. But this one night, uh, this man, he got very angry. Hey, maybe he had had a little too much at the inn. Yorn pauses. I guess he didn't like an Orlin talking back at him. I struck him. He came towards me, and I hit him. And he went over like a tree. As he struck his head on the way down, Yorn lowers his gaze and shrugs, helplessly. Turns out he was a knight. The Crucible Knights won't care how it happened. They just want me gone. They won't let me live long enough to see the rope. Please. He looks at you with a pleading expression. I just want to get out of this city. The second I can get my money for I can get money for passage, I won't trouble you anyone again, I swear it. I'll live quietly. But you can't. Please. Can't tell them I'm here. I don't have a contract for this. As far as I know, there is no reward for it. Like it hasn't been verified, so there, I have no reason to turn him in. If I had known about a reward, I would, but I think I'll, uh, with option one. Because as far as I know, there's just as much chance of me getting a reward for keeping his secret safe as there is for turning him in. So your secret is safe with me, Yorn. Yorn lets out a breath, obviously relieved. Thank you, he says with feeling. Truly. I'll be here much longer, if I can help it. Just, just have to get the coin together. What are to do down here, buddy? Yorn, we need to talk about your past. Okay, so I can come back, so there might be a quest for it, but we don't have it yet. Yorn's expression falls. Yes? I've told you what happened. I only beg you not tell anyone. Right. Alright, let's see if there is a reward. If there is, we'll probably come back for him. Huh? Is 
So there is a very good chance we'll be coming back to turn him in or just tell the knights. They never, we, we never mm -hmm. made a contract with Eorn there to see him safely out of the city. The knights, on the other hand, might have a nice profitable contract for us. You had five siblings? Between the six of us, I don't think the house has known a single day's quiet. Of course, a little chaos makes it far easier to get away with mischief. Yes, I can imagine that comes in handy. Huh? Mm -hmm. All right, we call the episode here, and the next one will explore House Domino, and if there's time, a Hadrid House and the Sanitarium. I'll probably save the Sanitarium for last because we know there's a quest there for us. So we go House Domino, Hadrid House, and then Sanitarium. But for now, thanks for watching. I'll see you guys in the next one.